In this seminar presentation, I'm going to work through identifying opportunities for climate litigation in or involving Australia. This is a presentation for a climate litigation workshop on the 22nd of July, 2019. I'm pre-recording it because the time available in the workshop is 15 minutes and I want to take the time to work through some of the complex issues here steadily. So it's going to take me more than 15 minutes. So in outline, what I'm going to do in this seminar is work through first two propositions about climate litigation and then identifying future climate litigation opportunities in or involving Australia. I want to work through 10 key issues and integrate that with a case study of potential litigation by PNG customary landholders against Australia's largest climate polluter for climate damages. So the two propositions about climate litigation are the first issue. So the first proposition is when considering opportunities for future climate litigation, we should move from abstract theories to real and specific case studies. That is the who, what, which court, how do we get the evidence, those sorts of issues. Because when we do that, legal analysis is then directed only to issues that are real and not imagined. Legal principle is then honed through practical application and academic abstraction is then curbed by the parameters of a concrete dispute. The second proposition that the basis of my presentation is that liability for climate change is widespread but largely unrealised. Common law causes of action and modern environmental laws are wide on their face. If they don't address climate change, that is a well-known major threat facing human society and the environment, which will cause huge property losses, then there's something seriously wrong with them. Just don't assume that is the case. Billions of people and trillions of dollars of property will be impacted by climate change. Where someone suffers loss, judges strive to find remedies, however imperfect. These points were made in an article that I wrote with Saul Holt QC last year, Climate Change is the Common Law Up to the Task, uh, 2018 Auckland, law, Auckland University Law Review. And we made the point that remedies such as damages go some way to address the harm caused by climate change. And the people who suffer loss due to climate change will be entitled to pursue governments, companies and individuals who are responsible for those losses. So the second part of my presentation is working through identifying future climate litigation opportunities and particularly these 10 key issues. So this is the list of the issues that I'm going to work through. Firstly, who are the potential plaintiffs? That is, who can sue? Things like who has legal standing, but also who is willing and suitable. So in, um, for climate litigation, particularly public interest litigation, where there are uh, public interest litigators like the Environmental Defenders Office uh, operating as the solicitors, you want clients who are rational and um, reasonable in their perspectives, but, but also willing to take professional legal advice. If someone doesn't fulfill those criteria, then they might be willing to sue, but they're not suitable as a client. So who are the potential plaintiffs is the first important um, issue. The second is, well, who are the potential defendants and who is the best to choose if there's multiple defendants? Then what causes of action are available? Judicial review, is there some... Uh, cause of action in tort or the like. Then what evidence is available to establish the cause of action? Fifthly, how should the evidence be presented or framed to best explain the facts and avoid defence strategies to avoid liability? You've got to expect that the defence is going to try and trip the court up and try and obfuscate, throw dirt in the judge's eye. So you should expect a dirty fight. So how do you explain complex facts simply to a judge who may not have dealt with these issues before. So how is your evidence best presented and framed is a critical issue. The sixth issue is what remedies are available that a court will realistically grant, things like damages or an injunction. Seventh, what court should the litigation be commenced in? Eighth, what are the procedural obstacles and how can they be overcome? Ninth, what resources are needed and available for the litigation, that is money, experts, lawyers. And finally, how do you avoid being overwhelmed by a big opponent? Because that's a significant issue. Okay, these issues all overlap 
and they build upon something I wrote back in 2008 in the Environmental and Planning Law Journal. So working through the first issue and I want to integrate it with a case study of um, Papua New Guinea customary landholders who are the potential plaintiffs who can sue. So the potential plaintiffs for my case study for this workshop are PNG customary landholders. So this I proposal comes from uh, a site visit that I undertook last year for a case where I'm acting in as counsel for some customary landholders in PNG. It, the case is about illegal land clearing in uh, New Hanover, an island in the northeast of PNG. This is a picture of me with some of the, um, the solicitor from uh, uh, CELCOR, the PNG Centre for Environmental Law and Community Rights, and a couple of interns from CELCOR, and one of the um, landholders who was ferrying, ferrying, ferrying us around. So New Hanover is in the northeast of Port, uh, northeast of Papua New Guinea, on the other side of the Bismarck Sea. Here's zooming in on the island. Uh, the purple splotches represent areas um, where clearing has occurred, uh, or logging has occurred, and that's what the court case I'm involved in is about. Uh, here's a picture of some of the logs that have been left behind. Now, while we were visiting the site, we stayed on a nearby island. Here's a picture of our boat coming in to land on the island. You can see it's very low lying. And here's um, a picture of where we stayed. Um, you can see the whole island and places where people live are only a foot or two above the um, ocean. And at night time, uh, all of the things that people were eating had come off the reef, mostly caught during the day. So during the day, there were people out spearfishing, fishing, um, yeah, just generally using the reef. And then in the evening, uh, that's what was on the evening menu, was basically fish that had come off the coral reef. And the thought, the sad thought I had while I was there was, well, these people are going to be hugely impacted by climate change because we know coral reefs will basically be wiped out. So there's going to be huge impacts on these people. So here's an image of um, the island where we stayed again, a uh, person in an outrigger canoe. Um, a key point uh, in relation to potential litigation is that in PNG, uh, about 97% of land is still in customary ownership, including this island. And customary ownership um, of land gives uh, a rights over adjacent um, reef areas to fish them. So damage to a coral reef is a damage to a property right that customary landholders on these islands have. So if they've got damage to a property right, you've got standing to sue. So Article 2 of the Paris Agreement sets the hard 2 degree target and an aspirational 1.5 degree target. We know that at those levels, coral reefs will be severely damaged. So this is an image from a paper from 2007 with the expected loss of coral reefs. Uh, on the left is an image of coral reefs at current levels of about a degree warming, so impacted but still relatively healthy. The middle image is at two degrees and the image on the right is at three degrees, so at two degrees severely impacted at three degrees all gone. Recently, that is in October last year, the IPCC released its special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees and in that they found that coral reefs are projected to decline by a further 70 to 90 percent at 1.5 degrees and over 99 percent at 2 degrees. So uh, yeah, basically even if we achieve the Paris Agreement targets of stabilizing mean global temperature rise beneath 1.5 degrees or beneath 2 degrees, coral reefs will be basically wiped out. So customary landholders in places like New Hanover are going to be severely impacted. That then raises the question, well, can they sue for damages such as the loss of coral reefs? And the question I ask is, well, if customary landholders on New Hanover will suffer large damages due to climate change, why can't they obtain a remedy from the law? If our laws don't deal with the biggest threat to the environment, then there's something seriously wrong with them. 
the second issue I want to work through is, well, who are the potential defendants and who is the best to choose? And a, a practical point uh, is that if possible, we want to limit any litigation to one corporation and one activity. And there's a really practical reason for that is that if you try and sue multiple large corporations for multiple activities simultaneously, you're going to multiply the complexity exponentially and you can simply be overwhelmed. So if you're going to take on a case like this, you really just need to choose one activity if possible and one corporation, Any anything more than that, and you're going to end up with another or multiple massive legal teams throwing all their resources at you and trying to basically um, destroy you with things like correspondence, all the procedural obstacles they can throw at you. You're going to be wrapped up in a whole heap of appeals. You, you just It just becomes so hard. So if possible, limit any litigation to one corporation and one activity. And if we're going to do that, well, let's choose the largest single polluter in Australia and look at, well, can they be liable? And the largest polluter uh, for a single activity in Australia is the operator of Luyang A power station in the Latrobe Valley. So that's about 160 kilometres east of Melbourne. And if we zoom in on the Latrobe Valley uh, in this Google Earth image, you can see three um, big power stations. So the Latrobe Valley has brown uh, coal. And so the uh, series, a number of power stations have been built to, to basically dig after the coal is dug out of the ground. It's basically burnt um, on, on site. Uh, Hazelwood Power Station was closed in 2017. Uh, the, the two or well, three operating power stations are Yulon Power Station and Luyang A and B Power Stations. So if we focus in on Luyang A and B, so in this image you can see the big open cut coal mine supplying power, sorry, supplying coal to the two power stations. Luyang A is on the left and Luyang B is on the right in this image. So if I zoom in, again, Luyang A is on the left, Luyang B. They're, they're closely related, but they're actually owned and operated by different companies. So Luyang A is operated by AGL Luyang Proprietary Limited, and Luyang B is a completely separate Alita, Alinta Energy. So this is a picture taken from the uh, open cut coal mine looking up towards the power stations and you can see Luyang A and B marked there. Or an image uh, again looking across the power stations with Luyang A in the foreground and Luyang B basically obscured by the steam rising off the cooling towers. So in an image like this, you can obviously there's a lot of clouds in the background there, the white billowing uh, steam isn't the dangerous thing from a climate perspective the um, point where emissions are coming out are these long tall stacks which is where the exhaust of when the coal is burnt uh, it comes out as um, carbon dioxide uh, so it's invisible um, to the naked eye so you can't see the pollution coming out of those stacks and don't be misled by the the white billowing clouds in the coming off the cooling towers the water vapor is relatively um, benign from from an anthropogenic climate change perspective it's the carbon dioxide that's coming from the coal that's the dangerous thing okay if we look at the largest emitters in australia this graph is from a 2014-2015 report by the australian clean energy regulator and lu yang a power station is shown on the far left and its emissions are over 18 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. The blue bars are the electricity production. So it's a relatively inefficient. Brown coal is in inefficient. It's got a high um, percentage of water. It's got a relatively low percentage of carbon in it compared to black coal. So the brown coal um, power generators in the Latrobe Valley are some of the most inefficient um, power stations in Australia. So Hazelwood, which was the second one, is now closed. So um, Luyang is the biggest by far. Now, when you see lists of the biggest polluters in Australia, you might see AGL uh, listed as the largest one. So this is a story from February of this year. 
with AGL being listed as, as emitting about 43 million tonnes and then Energy Australia about 21 million tonnes. Those are the corporate groups. So AGL has a number of different power stations uh, of coal and gas and particularly Luyang A, but also it owns Bayswater and Liddell power stations in um, New South Wales. So 43 million tonnes is its emissions from the AGL group. But if you start trying to take on the group, you actually have multiple corporations within it that actually operate it and multiple different activities. So if we just want to look at one activity and the largest emitter, it's uh, Luyang A is a, is owned or operated by a subsidiary of AGL, but taking on the AGL group is uh, raises all of the problems of suing multiple defendants um, and the complexity of it. So focusing on the corporate entity to the sue can be complex. Luyang A power stations operated by AGL Luyang Proprietary Limited under a license granted under the Environment Protection Act 1970 in Victoria. It's changed its names several times since its registration in 1997, but effectively it's still the same company. So it's, operate, it's owned by the Great Energy Alliance Corporation, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the AGL group. But the corporate entity that's operating it is AGL Luyang Proprietary Limited. So that would be, if we're choosing one company to sue, that would be it. So the third issue, well, what causes of action are available? Things like judicial review, tort. The interesting thing with PNG, and it's a fascinating, um, fascinating possibility, is a constitutional cause of action. It's unlike anything we've got in Australia. And uh, essentially, the PNG Constitution was written in 1975 and incorporates fundamental uh, freedoms uh, in it, as well as provisions that allow a contravention of those fundamental freedoms to be um, remedied in court. So uh, someone can claim compensation under section 57 and 58 of the constitution for contra contravening guaranteed rights and freedoms under sections 35, the right to life, 37, protection of the law with reference to the Environment Act uh, and section 53, possibly protection from unjust deprivation of property. So those are the three sections that jump out at me as giving a constitutional cause of action. So if you look at the Constitution, fascinating document. Absolutely, I've just been blown away with looking at it for the litigation that I'm, I'm working on and I've been through the process of getting admitted to the bar in, in PNG. It's an inspiring, amazing document and something that PNG can rightly be very proud of. It starts with uh, f stating five national goals and directive principles, including number four, which is natural resources and the environment and basically sustainable development, sustainable use of natural resources. And while the um, national goals and directive principles aren't uh, justiciable in themselves, they uh, are used in the interpretation of the constitution and they set the broad parameters for PNG society. So they're important. Then turning to the text of the Constitution itself, Section 35 provides that no person shall be deprived of his life intentionally, except, and then it goes on to some exceptions. Now, on the, it, you might think, well, climate change damages isn't depriving someone of their life, but the Eugenda Foundation and State of Netherlands case, recent important decision of the um, Court of Appeal uh, in the Netherlands, was based on Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights. Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights is the right to life. Everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. No one shall be deprived of his life intentionally, save, and then it goes on to some exceptions. So right to life was used in the Eugenda case. Uh, Article 8 was about uh, respect for private and family life. That was also used, but if you look at the judgment, uh, the Court of Appeal talked about the interest protected by Article 2 is the right to life, which includes environment-related situations that affect or threaten to affect the right to life. That's a powerful statement, and it's a very good 
uh, guide for what a court in PNG um, would interpret the right to life in section 35 to apply to climate damages. So uh, Eugenda is a precedent that could be applied in PNG for interpreting section 35 to apply to climate damages. So section 35 looks a lot like the right to life that was applied in the Eugenda case. Now, turning to section 37, protection of the law, every person has the right to the full protection of the law and the succeeding provisions of this section are intended to ensure that that right is fully available. That section can be joined with other aspects of PNG law. So national legislation in um, PNG, the Environment Act, it's a copy from the Environmental Protection Act 1994 in Queensland. So uh, it starts with a preamble, talks about giving effect to the national goals and directive principles to protect the environment, and then goes on to set up a series of provisions that on the face of them can easily apply to climate damages. So Section 11, causing serious environmental harm. A person who unlawfully causes a serious environmental harm is guilty of an offence. And when you look at the definition of environmental harm in Section 2, it's very broad and it may be caused by an act or omission, whether the harm is a direct or indirect result of the act or omission or results from the act or omission alone or from the combined effects of the act or omission and any other act or omission. So when you look at the definition of environmental harm, it fits very nicely with how climate change is being caused. It's being caused by many, many activities uh, around the globe. So if you were focusing on the emissions from Liang A power station, it doesn't matter that the emissions from Liang A power station itself don't cause global warming and impacts on the coral reefs uh, of customary landholders in Papua New Guinea. It's enough that it contributes to those uh, outcomes. So the operator of Luyang A, on the face of you know, the plain meaning of these sections, could be liable for causing serious environmental harm uh, then the question becomes, is it unlawful? So when we look at section 11, uh, it needs to be read in context, obviously. Um, principles for statutory interpretation in PNG are the same as in uh, Australia um, and other common law uh, jurisdictions. So take into account the objects and other relevant provisions. I just worked through a couple of them. So the objects are very broad, but they're basically to protect the environment uh, in PNG and allow for ecologically sustainable development. And I won't go through each one of them, but it's a very broad objective, protective objective. Section seven states the general environmental duty that a person shall not carry out an activity that causes or is likely to cause environmental harm unless the person takes all reasonable and practical measures to prevent or minimize the harm. And then there's some provisions for what you consider when you're assessing that, but the nature of the harm, the sensitivity of the receiving environment, as well as the financial implications, all of those things are weighed up. Section 9 talks about the responsibility for environmental harm, and it's, again, very broad. Uh, note 2B, except where the person took all reasonable and practical measures to prevent or minimise the harm. So if you have complied with the general environmental duty, then you're not responsible for the environmental harm. Unlawful environmental harm also brings in the general environmental duty, but goes further. It says that an act or omission that causes or is reasonably likely to cause environmental harm is unlawful unless it is caused in the course of complying with environmental code of practice or permitted to be done under a condition of environment of an environment permit. Now that's an environment permit under the Environment Act 2000, not under the Victorian um, Environmental 
Protection Act 1970, or a number of other provisions of the Papua New Guinea legislation. There's no recognition of the Victorian permit. Uh, however, in subsection 2, it's a defence to establish that the act remission was lawful and you comply with the general environmental duty. So compliance with the general environmental duty becomes a critical question for liability under the act. Now, I just want to note there's no equivalent in the Environment Act uh, to Section 25 of the Environmental Protection Act in Queensland, which expressly provides for extraterritorial operation of the Act. So if a person causes environmental harm within Queensland, that's caused by conduct engaged in outside of Queensland, they can still be liable under the Environmental Protection Act if what they have done in Queensland, uh, if they had done that activity in Queensland and um, it would have constituted an offence. So for instance, if they'd done an activity that wasn't specifically authorised under the Act and they didn't comply with the general environmental duty. So there's no equivalent to that in the Environment Act for PNG. Um, the Interpretation Act, uh, Section 2A, provides that there's a general operation of laws in PNG throughout the land, sea and airspace. It does not imply PNG laws can't operate outside these areas and there's no provision in the Interpretation Act that says they can't. And then in the PNG Constitution, there's an express statement that there's no presumption against extraterritoriality. So those um, are important bits of context for statutory interpretation. But the critical thing is really um, whether the offences in the Environment Act are result offences. And there's quite a lot of law on those type of offences, and particularly the decision in Browley and State Pollution Control Commission of 1992. That was a decision of Chief, Chief Justice Gleeson when he was the Chief Justice of New South Wales. And it's an important case where a Queensland farmer who polluted a river flowing into New South Wales that resulted in a fish kill in New South Wales was held liable under the New South Wales Clean Waters Act. And Chief Justice Gleeson described result offences and, for instance, referred to um, decisions of the House of Lords, such as this one, and stated, where a certain result is an essential part of conduct constituting a given offence, then the conduct, that conduct may be relevantly regarded as local if the result in question is one occurring within the territory in question. So on the face of it, Section 11 of the PNG Environment Act is a result offence. A person who unlawfully causes serious environmental harm, the serious environmental harm, if it occurs in PNG, it's unlawful and you have a liability under Section 11. It's a result offence. Similarly, um, if we're looking at uh, liability under the PNG Constitution, another section that may be relevant is Section 53. Subject to Section 54, um, possession shall not be compulsorily taken of any property and no interest in or right over property may be compulsorily acquired except in accordance with an act of parliament such as compulsory acquisition laws. So that's a protection from unjust deprivation of property. And on its face, taking possession or acquiring property, the operator of Luyang A power station operating in Victoria, on a plain meaning, you would think they haven't taken possession of the coral reef or acquired it, is simply damaging or destroying it enough to give a cause of action under Section 53. There's actually a number of PNG cases that suggest Section 53, in conjunction with other constitutional rights and the common law, also protects against destruction of property. There's been a series of cases about police going in and destroying villages and the state of PNG being held liable for the destruction. Now, they haven't, the police um, didn't possess or acquire the property when you, if you destroy someone's house, 
then and you don't have possession of it or acquire it afterwards then on the face of it it doesn't fall within section 53 the decisions wrap up section 53 with other um, protections under the constitution so it's not clear cut that section 53 applies in its own right to destruction of property um, but it's an open question also human rights protection should be construed in a liberal way uh, that's um, case law to support that so section 53 may apply um, but section 35 and 37 um, quite clearly um, apply you know, even if section 53 doesn't just mentioned also causes of action in private and public nuisance potentially uh, there's uh, some useful png case law on that i won't dwell on those common law causes of action but uh, it key thing is um, the an operator of luyang a power station would have to rely upon um, either their statutory authority the defensive statutory authority or that what they were doing was otherwise lawful and not unreasonable it, and it's coming it comes back to similar sorts of concepts like the general environmental duty under the environment act and um, it really on the on the face of when you when you really look at these provisions, um, my view is there's no, it, it's not obvious that they don't apply. I know that's a double negative, but the um, common law causes of action on their face potentially apply to uh, also create liability. PNG also um, goes beyond the common law and has. Uh, and the a concept of the underlying law which can be developed from uh, the common law as well as uh, png customary law and can be developed by the png courts to be uh, more appropriate for the situation in png so these common law causes of action uh, when you blend them with the underlying law concepts in png certainly are not a dead letter for a potential cause of action in PNG and certainly I'd suggest to plead them and have the fight about their operation in conjunction with the PNG uh, constitution. So can an Australian polluter be liable for damage in PNG? Well my view is yes. So issues four and five, um, what evidence is available to establish the causes of action? And how should the evidence be presented or framed to best explain the facts and avoid defence strategies to avoid liability? The basic idea I mentioned in my introduction, but uh, don't expect, um, well, expect a dirty fight. Expect that the defence is going to try and confuse the court. And uh, that can work in a case involving climate change where the science can um, be confusing for the judge and uh, I've been in cases where judges say well I can't attribute any particular impact from the emissions from this um, polluter therefore I'm not going to find any liability and so they get confused about causation concepts and you need to basically um, plan for that and frame your evidence so that you can explain the cause of action and explain how it's established clearly to a judge who may have limited scientific background, very limited background in climate change generally. So the good news in that sense is that there's some great um, science uh, establishing the critical factual issues relevant to the cause of action so the ipcc special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees and i mentioned before clear statements about coral reefs being um, basically wiped out at 1.5 or 2 degrees so that's what the world is aiming at so we know that basically even if the world succeeds in achieving the objectives under um, the paris agreement which many people say is is doubtful but you know they're probably the best 
that we can hope for, 1.5 or 2 degrees. Even if we achieve that, customary landholders in PNG are going to have their surrounding reefs destroyed. So they should be able to sue for that loss and they should be able to sue someone. So the climate science um, um, brings in how we should frame our case as well because while annual emissions of carbon dioxide are more commonly referred to in political and public discussions of climate change, it's the cumulative emissions of CO2 over time that are the critical issue because the emissions of CO2 from fossil fuels will continue to affect the atmosphere through the active carbon cycle for centuries to millennia. So from the, that basic proposition that, that emissions basically are um, for, say, a thousand years, so what we emit now uh, we can think of as basically being continuing to affect the atmosphere for a thousand years or so. So from that, the concept of the carbon budget has been developed, an idea that, well, what can be the, the total cumulative emissions from human activities to have a reasonable chance of limiting mean global temperature rises to a given level. So initially that was the two degree target and now that's been um, updated with the 1.5 degree target under the Paris Agreement. So we know, we know from this concept that we've got a defined quantity within which the contribution of emissions from Luyang A power station can be assessed and that avoids the uh, sort of dry, the, the trip up that can be played by defendants by saying there's emissions occurring all over the world. You can't say what I'm doing is going to cause any particular damage. If we place it within the context of the carbon budget, we can attribute a, the uh, sort of a frame to the emissions from an individual source. Now, in deriving um, a global carbon budget that's relevant for, say, looking at Lu Yang A power station, we can look at the IPCC report. There's a really interesting uh, update or um, report by Pr um, Professor Malta Mainshausen at University of Melbourne, uh, a fantastic uh, international climate scientist um, who uh, recently wrote a report for um, Victorian interim targets on developing a 1.5 degree carbon emission uh, or greenhouse gas emissions budget. And uh, he made a number of adjustments to the IPCC um, carbon budget, which I'm going to adopt um, for the purposes of this presentation. So the table that you see in blue is from the IPCC report and it talked about the remaining carbon budget from 2018 to have a reasonable chance of achieving the 1.5 or 2 degree target. Um, Professor Mainshausen makes two adjustments to those targets. So you see there for 1.5 degrees C, there's 580 gigatons of carbon dioxide is the carbon budget for a 50% chance of achieving um, 1.5 degrees. And for a 50% chance of achieving 2 degrees, the remaining budget is 1,500 gigatons. So Professor Mainshausen made two adjustments, minus 100 gigatons, um, which is acknowledged in the IPCC um, table to account for permafrost related feedbacks and also um, minus 180 gigatons for um, basically to get the time frames right. So if you take off 280 gigatons from the figures in the IPCC special assessment report then that gives from the beginning of 2018 a carbon budget of 300 gigatons to have a 50% chance of uh, achieving the 1.5 degree target or 1,220 gigatons to have a 50% chance of achieving the 2 degree target. So when we calculate the contribution to the carbon budget from a polluter like the operator of Luyang A, we could start in 1997 to include past emissions. Um, and because well, that's because the operator uh, has been operating since 1997, so we could go back or start at 2000. We could start at basically any time since they've been operating. 
Um, or we could start to be consistent with the IPCC um, recent report, simply start in 2018 uh, and go forward. I'm going to do the latter for present purposes. It doesn't make a huge difference, um, but for simplicity, let's just start from now and look forward. So when do we end? Well, Lu Yang A um, has been the, the operator or the owner of Lu Yang A has said that they expect to keep going till 2048. So uh, that's from a report uh, in the, the news last year. So we've got um, emissions to 2048 from now. So we can frame the cause of action around the company's emissions from now till 2048 and then look at it as, as a percentage of the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 or 2 degrees. So the emissions from Lu Yang A each year are about 18.625 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. We multiply that by 30 years, it gives us cumulative emissions of 559 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So those emissions equal about 0.2 of a percent or one in 500th, 537th part of the 1.5 degree budget or about 0.05% of the two degree budget. So think of that. I find it remarkable that you've got a single emitter in Australia, a single power station, and at a global scale, they are going to emit 0.2% of the remaining carbon budget. That's a remarkably, you know, a huge, my view is that's an, uh, an, an incredibly large, uh, when you consider the context of the emissions, that these are global and this is the entire remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. Uh, just incredible. Anyway, these uh, emissions, um, you've got those percentages from 2018 for a 50% probability of exceeding the 1.5 or 2 degree target. Now you could... Um, I won't get any more complicated than that um, for present purposes. Uh, you could you could frame it in, in different ways. This is a simple way to do it um, for present purposes. Now, in thinking about things like uh, the general environmental duty and whether the emissions are unreasonable in a common law nuisance uh, sense, um, Again, recent evidence is very useful uh, on this. There's evidence that burning brown coal at Luyang A to generate electricity is unreasonable and contrary to the general environmental duty. If not right now, then well before 2048. Um, this is a cover of a report from um, a number of authors, including Frank Jotso, an economist from uh, ANU, about coal transitions in Australia. And... When this report came out, this is just a quote from him, so a very well-regarded uh, expert in Australia. So Frank Jotso, Jotso from ANU says it's clear to him that a crossover point is fast approaching where the combination of renewable storage, demand response, and portfolio diversity will beat the operating cost of existing coal-fired power stations. And then there's a quote from him saying, at that point, it will make commercial sense to replace coal plants with new renewable installations, irrespective of their remaining technical lifetime, and even before taking into account carbon emissions and local air pollution. So that's a remarkable statement, because when you think about the criteria for assessing something like the general environmental duty, if it's simply financially sensible to change to renewables, then burning coal can't possibly comply with the general environmental duty when you take into account also the environmental harm that's caused by it and the sensitivity of the receiving environment. So my view would be that right now the emissions from coal-fired power stations when you take into account their environmental impacts are not complying with the general environmental duty under not only the PNG uh, legislation but also legislation like the Queensland Environmental Protection Act and the impacts in Queensland, similar to the impacts in Papua New Guinea. So 
that's just very briefly looking at some of the evidence that you'd use to, to establish the cause of action uh, in Papua New Guinea. And then if we looked at you know, potential witnesses who might establish this evidence, then I've just listed some that spring to mind for me. So you might look at three areas for expert evidence, uh, impacts on coral reefs, and two fantastic Australian experts that you could use as um, Professor Ovie Goberg or Professor Terry Hughes, both internationally regarded uh, experts who have uh, published a great deal of research showing the uh, impacts on coral reefs. And um, secondly, the contribution to the carbon budget. Well, Professor Mainshausen um, would be a fantastic expert to use. There's also Professor David Caroli, again from the University of Melbourne. Uh, Professor Will Steffen, uh, Emeritus Professor Will Steffen, formerly of, or oh, he's an Emeritus Professor from uh, ANU and uh, was a fantastic uh, expert for and, and highly regarded in the recent uh, Gloucester Resources decision, the successful case before Chief Justice, Chief Judge Preston in the New South Wales Land Environment Court where um, Chief Judge Preston uh, refused an application for a coal mine um, in near Gloucester. So um, Will Stephan would again be uh, an excellent um, potential expert. And then in terms of economics and energy sources, that is relevant to the context um, of the general environmental duty and unreasonableness. Well, Professor Frank Jotso, um, from his public statements, uh, also would be uh, a suitable expert. So those are the potential witnesses that you might look at. Then turning to um, another issue, what remedies are available that a court will realistically grant? I wanted to focus on that, um, mention the PNG Constitution, um, Section 22, talks about enforcement of the Constitution and basically says this Constitution um, recognises the rights of individuals and the courts uh, shall, as far as practicable, um, give them remedies. So that's a very powerful statement in the PNG Constitution. And then Section 57 provides a, a right to um, bring proceedings to enforce uh, a right of freedom uh, under the PNG Constitution. And Section 58 gives a right to seek compensation. So compensation or damages is a very important um, right in the context. I'll get to procedural obstacles for the proceedings. So those are the sorts of remedies that you, you'd look at. Um, compensation on damages rather than an injunction to stop the harm by shutting down the power station. And that's important, really important, because uh, if you were seeking injunction, even if you establish that unlawful harm is being caused, the court has a discretion um, not to grant injunctive relief. And sorts of cases like Warringah Shire Council and Sedevic are commonly cited in for those sorts of propositions. So where you're seeking an injunction, the court, if you establish that, yes, there's a breach of an environmental law, but the court can then take into account things like the public interest um, and the coal, the coal-fired power generator would argue, well, we are getting, you know, we're supplying power to other people in Victoria. The lights will go out, hospitals will shut down, everyone will go back to living in caves. You know, they make those sorts of claims. Um, they would weigh very heavily on a court making an order to shut down the power station. And it would be very difficult to get an order um, from a court to that effect. However, if you're only seeking damages and you're saying, well, we're not seeking to shut the power station down, we simply want them to compensate us for the damage that they will cause, then there's much less discretion not to grant that remedy as opposed to an injunction. So there's a, a real benefit in only seeking that and not seeking an injunction. Issue seven, what court should the litigation be commenced in? The National Court of Justice is effectively like 
the Supreme Courts at a state level in Australia. So in PNG, the uh, senior appellate court or the top appellate court is the Supreme Court and that's the equivalent of Australia's High Court. The National Court of Justice is a superior court of record um, for the whole of PNG uh, and then beneath it there's district courts, local courts and village courts and a couple of specialist courts, the Land Court and the Warden's Court. So the National Court of Justice would be the appropriate court to sue in and that's just a little bit of background on it. You know, it's uh, established in the Constitution, it's got unlimited original jurisdiction, it includes enforcing constitutional rights and freedoms, etc. Issue 8, what are the procedural obstacles and can they be overcome? So two important ones that I want to mention is service in Australia. So if you want to sue someone, you have to be able to initiate the proceedings correctly, uh, otherwise you can't get a remedy from the court. Uh, so even if they you know, if you initiate proceedings correctly, if they don't show up to court, the court can proceed to grant you a remedy. So if a company is resident in the jurisdiction where you're suing, then, or a person is resident, you can, like if it's a person, you can go up and give them the initiating process, hand it to them, say this is a, a claim and a statement of claim from the Supreme Court of uh, Victoria or Queensland, wherever you're suing from. And if they refuse, if it's a real person, if they refuse to accept it, you can place it in their presence and identify what it is. And you can then give an affidavit uh, about proper service. If it's a corporation, then you can serve the company by delivering the initiating process to their um, registered business office during normal hours, normal, normal business hours. Um, but if the defendant that you want to sue isn't present in the jurisdiction, then you need to go to court on an ex parte basis and get the leave of the court to serve that person or company outside the jurisdiction. So the national court rules basically are the same as similar rules in Australia. So um, suing defendants in other countries uh, is common, or re relatively common. And uh, so there's a, a range of um, criteria that are well established for when a court will grant you leave. So uh, the relevant ones under the National Court Rules, Order 16, Rule 19, are where the proceedings are founded on a cause of action arising in PNG. Well, if you're suing under the PNG Constitution, then it arises in PNG. The proceedings are founded on or are for the recovery of damage suffered wholly or partly in PNG caused by a tortious act or omission wherever occurring. So clear extraterritorial operation, um, the damage being suffered in PNG. So E is clearly a, a criteria that could be relied upon for service um, outside PNG. L, the proceedings concern the construction, effect or enforcement of an act or regulation or other instrument having or purporting to have effect. Um, affecting property in PNG, well, the PNG Constitution, the Environment Act, um, give you you know a tick for that one as well are the proceedings concerned the construction effect or enforcement of an act or regulation or other instrument have or purporting to have effect or an act well again we've got the PNG constitution uh, as well as, which is an act of uh, the PNG parliament as well as um, the environment act so there's numerous triggers that would give you the ability to um, get leave to serve in Australia. I just mentioned that political issues are irrelevant for the grant of leave to serve outside the jurisdiction. So uh, there's that interesting case that I was junior counsel uh, in Humane Society International in Kyoto and Paku where Humane Society sued the Japanese whalers uh, who were operating from Japan killing whales in Australia's Antarctic waters. And uh, anyway, that's a, a case that established that political issues are irrelevant. So it wouldn't matter that um, the Australian government might be upset that someone in Papua New Guinea was suing an Australian uh, coal-fired power generator. That wouldn't matter for the PNG court. Another procedural issue that I just wanted to mention was enforcement in Australia. And 
in this regard, again, going simply for damages rather than an injunction is really beneficial because an order for damages for climate change impacts uh, and costs against the operator of the Luyang A power station from the PNG National Court of Justice appears to be enforceable in Australia. Um, the PNG National Court of Justice is a superior court listed in the Foreign Judgments Regulations, 1992 Commonwealth, and an order for damages and costs from it could be registered under the Foreign Judgments Act and then enforced in the Victorian Supreme Court. And such an order from the National Court of Justice would not be an order for in an antitrust proceedings that may be made unenforceable under Section 9 of the Foreign Proceedings Excess of Jurisdiction Act 1984. So given the highly political nature of climate change liability, I would also say there's some possibility that the Australian government would change the law to defeat an award of damages and costs in this case from being enforceable in Australia. But as the law currently stands, you could enforce, say, there was an award of, say, 500,000 kina or 5 million kina. Wouldn't, doesn't, the amount doesn't really matter. 5 million kina, um, you know, a few million dollars. The amount doesn't matter uh, because it's just a monetary um, award. It can be enforced under the Foreign Judgments Act in Australia. So those are a couple of uh, significant procedural issues. Then wrapping up uh, issues 9 and 10, what resources are needed and available for the litigation, money, experts and lawyers, and how do you avoid being overwhelmed by a big opponent? Well, resources, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in climate litigation. I've just got this screen grab from um, Michael Bloomberg pledging 715 million to close US coal power plants. So that's from June of this year. So his focus is on US um, power plants, but there's no reason why they wouldn't also be willing to fund litigation um, along the lines of what I've outlined. Also, litigation funders um, are a potential uh, avenue to gain resources because you're going for significant damages. This is a sort of action where you might get litigation funding support, and that is a significant uh, additional reason to seek damages rather than injunctive relief. And, uh, yeah, in terms of not being overwhelmed, a thing that I, I've said on my website in terms of lessons for public interest lawyers is basically you, yeah, litigation like this could be a, would be probably a very difficult war of attrition. And basically you need the courage and tenacity to take it on and then see it through because it's going to be a hard fight. But sometimes that's what you need to do. You just need to get in and fight for your clients. So to wrap up, I've dealt with two propositions about climate litigation and identifying future climate litigation opportunities. And I just conclude by saying we should fight for the future we want, not passively accept terrible outcomes for our kids' futures. As lawyers, litigation is one tool we can use in this fight for our clients.